So, Chapter 2, Working Inside the Computer. Our main objective for this chapter is learning how to take it apart properly, uh, learning about methods for keeping the, the system cool. I want to say cool and clean, but uh, clean in multiple chapters, but clean ties directly in with keeping it cool. Lastly, we're going to have to talk about how to select the proper power supply. That's always very important. So, one of the biggest skills that we have to know is how do we work inside the computer? How do we even take off the case or the, the side panel or how do we uh, take apart a laptop? These are very important skills that sometimes people lack. And sometimes it's not so much the competency of the technician, sometimes it's just case design. I've had numerous cases where uh, it, it took a few minutes to figure out how to take off the side panel or even just to open it up. Uh, Dell is very notorious for changing their case styles, so you don't know the, the correct way to actually get it open. So, step one before we start diving into taking it apart is, let's, let's make some notes. It's always easier to be able to backtrack. Uh, if we know we take off four screws first, and then the side panel, we kind of document what we're going to be doing. That way, if for whatever reason we're called away, someone can step in behind us and put it back together, one, or what happens if you, this is stretched between multiple days and you forget something. It's always easier to, to make notes so that you can always go back and just verify. Uh, it happens, it really does, and sometimes we start with one case with ten screws and uh, we end with one case and eight screws and two leftover screws and we have no idea where those screws came from. Uh, if you're a mechanic or deal with mechanics you get that reference but it's never a good thing. Another important thing is we kind of already talked about it but removing loose jewelry. That is rings, watches, uh, necklaces that are long. Uh, honestly, I, I'll, I also talk about clothes. Uh, you don't want to lean in with uh, baggy clothes or long, long hair. Anything that can get inside the case, you want to be careful of that. Uh, stay organized by keeping all the small parts in one place and at a very specific uh, layout. We talked about Chapter 1, why they had cups. And a big part of that is just to keep the screws organized. Uh, don't stack the boards or uh, the electrical components on top of each uh, on top of each other. One of the biggest issues that we have is these boards, all of these components are very susceptible to electrical discharge or ESD. So we have to be careful. Last thing is do not touch board chips. Uh, because they're programmed, uh, they are extremely susceptible to oils or uh, magnetism. So we want to be careful. The uh, oil on our fingerprints can cause corrosion. The magnetic uh, screwdrivers can cause the chip to uh, be damaged. Remember, we have to protect ourselves and the equipment. A big component there is do not touch anything inside the case when the computer is turned on. Okay, that's just a general rule of thumb. Not that you can't, because you can touch a cable. It's just, if you start moving around cables while the computer's on, 
it's really easy for one of the cables to jar, uh, jar loose and get touch a fan, for example. I've had that happen, that explodes fairly quickly. But what happens if you touch a metal component that's conducting electricity and it shocks you? Or you're at different polarities and you shock it? So it's just roll of thumb, don't touch it, the inside of the case with it on. Next, consider the monitor and power supply as black boxes. Essentially, you do not take them apart. When we talked about our filled resupply unit, this is what we were alluding to. Those are specialty devices that it's far cheaper and safer just to buy a new one. Uh, for me, honestly, I, I won't open a power supply. I have electrical friends that are electrical engineers. Uh, they, they do, and theirs works. It's just the average person isn't going to be able to do that. On top of that, they're dangerous. So, got to be careful there. Again, we drill this in. Protect against a, a static electricity, a static discharge, electrostatic discharge, discharge of any form of electricity. <laughs> That's super important. We want to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and the equipment from discharge. Lastly, for our safety, watch out for sharp edges. We looked inside our case last week. The cases seemed very round. However, there's a lot of jagged parts that we don't think about that can do some serious damage. So moving on to step two. Because again, when we deal with technology, we're dealing with end user data. And so we actually have to make sure that whatever computer we're working on, their data is backed up or is in such a manner where we cannot get blamed for them losing something. That's fairly common. Well, I gave the IT person my computer and I lost all my files. Even though the IT person specifically asked that user if there was anything that needed to be uh, backed up, the user said no. Uh, that that's so common. Alright, so before we start opening the case, uh, obviously uh, we want to make sure that it's unplugged, it's not powered on, but this also includes any of the peripherals as well. Again, these are general rules of thumb, but any, any peripheral, anything that might be connected to the motherboard might have its own power and thus could feed the motherboard power. So we want to make sure that everything is unplugged. Also, once everything is disconnected, press and hold the power button for a few seconds. Yes, so if there's any additional power in the power supply or electricity in the power supply, this will drain all of it. Uh, have either a plastic bag or a cup or some, some type of a system to organize the screws and then let's open the case. Uh, more modern day cases are having the screwless entry. That just means there's no screws, but again, it's all going to be uh, very subjective depending on what you're working on. We've already talked about the IO shield and uh, its general purpose. What's interesting here is, when we work on devices like this, we want to make sure that the motherboard is always down. Because again, the motherboard is just screwed on into the case, so we don't want to add additional weight. If we put the motherboard uh, on top, that means we have to work around it, and that just doesn't make a lot of sense. So it's easier to put the motherboard face down. The I.O. shield is directly in front of the motherboard, so that's how you can verify which way is which. 
Uh, we're going to locate the screws and unscrew the uh, screws that are appropriate for the side panel that we want to open. Uh, again, appropriate for the panel that we want to open. We don't have to unscrew every screw. We just have to unscrew the screws that are blocking us from entering one side. I had a guy that wanted to unscrew everything and he always unscrewed everything and that's not always a good way of doing things. Notice this gentleman has anti-static gloves. Again, great in theory but very impractical in practice. It really depends on the field that you're working in and how much money the company has. Uh, if you're working for like NASA, maybe. Uh, if you're dealing with a, even a casino or mom and pop or a medium sized business here in town, you're not going to be doing anti static gloves. That's just not very realistic. See if there's any systems, uh, clips, or locks, or anything that might prevent the system from opening. Uh, we have Lenovo's in the classroom and they are locked shut. So they're the locking mechanism that prevents students from opening the case. So you do have to be uh, careful of that. Uh, once that locking mechanism is out of play, you can actually remove the side panel. Now again, bear in mind that you might not be working with a computer case that's opening with a side panel. Uh, again, very subjective. It really all depends on the case that you're working with. A lot of modern day cases have side panels, but don't assume that they all are going to. Some cases, depending, uh, also have a front cover that you may or may not need to remove depending on what you want to access. Uh, some of uh, the Dell servers require you to remove the front panel before you can remove the side panel. So it really all depends on the case. I disagree with this figure. Uh, I don't think that it's a newer computer uh, related issue. Because actually I have a brand new case that was manufactured uh, here this year and it's also a side panel. It really all just depends on the manufacturer and what they wanted. So this is a big thing. There's typically something preventing the side panel from coming off, assuming that it is a side panel. Uh, the first few diagrams we were looking at were screws in the back. Here's just an example of screws in the front. But notice, the optical drive and the floppy drive are out a little bit. But you'll notice that if that front panel was on, this optical drive would be parallel with the front panel. So that's something you have to think about. And again, uh, remove the side, uh, the side panel. But you'll notice there's a dip in it. When we look at the... Uh, Okay, uh, side panel coming off the other way, the dip was in the back. This time, the dip's in the front. That's kind of a way to look at, well, how do I pull the, the side panel off? Is Where is that easy-to-grip dip? So once the side panel's off, what do we do? First thing we want to do is make sure that our grounding bracelet is attached to metal inside of the case. Uh, also, once you remove the side panel, we have access to all the internal components. A big thing here is we want to make sure that we understand what all the cables are going to the motherboard and what they're for. Fairly common, especially in an intro to a PC hardware type class, students will unplug cables and plug them in the wrong way, or plug cables in that shouldn't belong. We've noticed that some cables you cannot plug in wrong. For example, the P1 and auxiliary power connector. It's really hard to plug those guys in wrong. 
but sometimes it happens. So just making sure that we're plugging what well, we know what we're plugging in and what they go to. That's the key uh, here. Now let's be realistic. Wherever we clip that, we want to make sure, first of all, it's out of our way, as well as it's not going to come loose. Because that's fairly common, is it will come loose. Also, notice that it's a bungee on the uh, strap. So once he lets go, all of that's got to fall inside the case. So again, we want to be kind of careful where, where we put it and uh, it, where the cable will fall as well as will it be easy to come off. That's fairly common. Next, we're going to talk about removing all of the components. I've heard a lot of people say draw a diagram. I mean, this goes back to that documentation so you know what you're removing and you know where it came from. Uh, I kind of like the second point, uh, use a felt tip marker, a permanent marker, so that we can indicate placement, order, orientation. Uh, realistically, if you're in the field and you're working on someone's computer and you start marking them up with a felt tip pen, I'm pretty sure they won't be very happy. So a big part of this is practice and again, laying it out in a very specific order so that you know how you took it apart. That way you can put it back together with no extra leftover parts. This is going to be a very popular one to document. So we talked about everything connecting to the motherboard, including the case. So how does the case connect to the motherboard? Minus the screws that go through the motherboard holding it into the case. Well here are our essentially a uh, front uh, cable connector cables. These are our power switch, our reset switch. Um, if we have LEDs on our case or other things. These are the super most critical set of cables that we mainly deal with. Well, one, one set. Uh, especially because there's that orange and white cable that's the power button. If that is not on those two correct pins, when you hit the power button for your case, the motherboard has no idea that that was the power button. So making sure that we do these pins correctly is very crucial. Uh, again, when we remove the expansion cards, we remove the we trace the cables so we know what they are, we know where they go, and we document them. Once we document them, then we remove them. But that way we can make sure that we're uh, putting back everything that needs to go back properly. And that also goes with screws that hold that specific uh, expansion card on. Uh, when you remove it, grasp the card with both hands and you lift it straight up. All that means is you want to make sure that when we do when we deal with this, we don't deal with trying to bend any components. We don't want to put anything in at a weird angle. We want to be able to pull just straight up. Again, be careful when you grab any device inside the computer case. You do not want to grab chips specifically. Again, our fingers have oil on our hands. Uh, once we remove a card, we want to make sure that we're dealing with it safely. Uh, safely, not safely. Uh, Anti-static bag. That's going to be our friend here. As we remove components, we put the extra components inside a plastic bag. Okay, so now, depending on our task, depending on what we're doing, uh, we're going to be removing the motherboard, power supply, and drives. 
but again, it really all depends on the system and the way that it's structured. So we're going to be typically removing the power of other board first. Uh, however, in some cases, the power supply is actually directly over the motherboard, so you have to remove that first. So, I mean, it really all depends on your situation. But general guidelines is unplug everything, document unplug everything. Once everything is unplugged, then you should be able to start unscrewing everything. Once everything is unscrewed, pull it out. Uh, say, uh, same thing with our motherboard, same thing with our optical drive, our hard drives, document, remove cables, remove screws, remove. Here, the technician has removed everything from the motherboard and has removed all the screws, and so he should be able to pull just directly up. Uh, however, you'll notice that the I.O. shield is still there. So we kind of have to pull up and out. That way we can remove our back of the case connectors from that I.O. shield. But once we do that, we pull directly up. So our power supply, same thing. We document where the cables go. We document how many cables we're using. Once we do that, we disconnect all the cables, and then we unscrew the screws. Normally with power supplies, it's fairly common to just have four screws holding it in. But it's important to know, or important to realize, uh, which way. Uh, how is it oriented? Uh, you'll notice in this photo that there is a bulk collection of cables that's located more towards the bottom left hand side of that power supply inside the case. Well if we oriented this a different way that bundle might be now towards the top. So I mean that, those are just things to kind of bear in mind. Uh, how are we orienting this power supply? Uh, sometimes they fit any which way, sometimes they don't. So you want to Kind of make sure that you are documenting which way you pulled it out so that you can put it back the correct way. Now we talked about standardization. This power supply should be a standard fit power supply. However, don't assume. I made that mistake where I bought a newer power supply and it should be able to fit inside a standard case. And nope, it didn't. For removing our drive, same thing like our motherboard, same thing like our power supply. We trace the cables, we find out where they go, we document, we unscrew them. Once they're unscrewed, we have to think about how to actually remove them. Do they go inside the case, or do they get pulled out from the front of the case? Because, typically the optical drives get pulled out. You'll notice that by the technician's thumb, there's the front face for that optical drive. It's a little bit thicker than the rest of its body. So it prevents it from being pulled in from the inside of the case. However, a floppy is not. A floppy, you can actually install it from the back or the, the inside of the case. Sometimes cases might have some form of hard drive bay. Uh, and that really is just a bay that has all the hard drives uh, together. But that makes it easy to mount all of them or uh, unmount all of them. Screw versus uh, all of them together or not. But again, we have to be careful. We document trace the data cable, or trace the cables, unscrew, and then remove. Now, once we uh, have everything, 
if we had to replace anything, we would replace the data component. Let's say we are replacing a motherboard power supply and drive. Uh, the three things that we kind of just talked about. We would refer to, to our documentation and we would install the components. So we did our motherboard, our power supply, then our opt or then our drives. However, when we go to put the uh, computer back, we start with our power supply. Just because it has, well, it's going to make the biggest mess, honestly. So if we do the power supply first, we can actually route all those power cables how we want, then our drives, then our motherboard. A big thing here is make sure that the holes and the ports for the motherboard line up to the case. We're going to talk about this in class, but again, we talked about standard uh, hole placement. So we want to make sure that our holes are lining up. Now, not every case will have every hole. Uh, they should have almost all of them, but as long as the majority of the holes are lining up, we are good. So once we have everything installed, once we have the power supply, motherboard, drive, everything back, we start connecting our power. Again, we talked about the P1, and we talked about our auxiliary. Those are our critical ones. But if we have a higher end video card, we would have to make sure that we install our video card power as well. Here's an example of our P1. Again, placement is going to vary. It all kind of depends. Here's an example of our 4-pin auxiliary. Again, it's going to vary, but uh, typically most modern day ones have them. Uh, if you're not sure, you can always check the documentation. That's a big one, is we always double check our documentation just to verify. So once we've done those two, we start looking at other power that we might have to connect. One of the big ones are our fans. We want to make sure that our fans are connected. Once our fans are connected, we have to connect our front uh, leads from our front panel. That's those guys. And those are, again, just connecting the K for chassis to our motherboard. Now when we look at this, the important, the two very specific important ones, power switch and reset switch, however, those are not just the only important ones. If we want our case USB to work, we have to make sure our uh, USB cable is uh, directly connected. If we want our, audio, our front audio to work, we want our front audio. If we want our lights, we want to make sure our light uh, leads are there as well. Not just there, but plugged in correctly. We're going to use uh, our motherboard manual to verify that we have all of these plugged in correctly. Uh, normally, they are labeled. However, this is really zoomed in. Uh, they're not always going to be this nice, neat, and organized. Uh, again, we check our manual. That's how we know. Now it says look for the small triangle so that we know how to plug these ones in. I've never seen a small triangle on either side on most cases. Uh, how I normally tell people is trial and error. Try it one way. If it works, you're good. If it doesn't work, switch it around. Uh, most of the time, it doesn't matter which way you plug them in. Uh, they realize that their auto uh, that people plug them in wrong, so they're auto sensing. So don't have to worry about that there. Once we connect our motherboard, we start adding everything else back in. Our video, uh, any expansion cards that we had, our video mouse. 
power lasts just because again we want to make sure that our we have no way to do any type of ESD once all everything is back together and we verify that our fan is plugged in we turn it on uh, not just our fan is plugged in but our fla uh, fans are clear of any obstacles there's no cables in them and then we turn them on we listen for any odd noise if we do hear any odd noise we immediately hit the power switch in the back and we unplug it and we try to see what's causing the odd noise the reason I say this is because uh, cables come, uh, cables do come loose uh, cable moves uh, those are all things that happen but if it falls into a fan it can cause that fan to break so kind of have to be careful there Lastly, we're going to talk about cooling methods. This is always a fun one. Okay, so when we're dealing with our cooling, normally we have to talk about active versus passive. That is, is the component moving, active, or is it idle, or just sitting there, passive? Because there's different ways to cool, and it also depends on the need for the cooling. For example, a processor, processor gets really hot. It needs combination of both. It's going to use a metal heat sink, which is passive, uh, with a fan on top to help circulate air through it, active. However, we can also talk about uh, liquid cooling or hydrogen cooling or liquid nitrogen cooling or different extreme methods of cooling. But the purpose of cooling is to take heat that's centralized somewhere and to help get cool air uh, moving across it to help cool it down. So realistically, when we talk about heat, how hot are we talking about? Uh, maximum, we're talking, uh, Intel is made to go 185 degrees. That's 85 degrees Celsius. That's pretty hot. Now realistically, anything above 120, 130, it's actually working uh, nowhere near its optimal. Closer to 100, 15, 110, that's pretty average. It also kind of depends on the room that you're in as well. We're in Vegas. Uh, the rooms during the summer get quite warm. Uh, your PC is going to run a little bit hotter. I mean, that's just uh, life. However, how hot can it get before it starts just degrading its performance? Again, 120, 130, I would be kind of be careful with. Uh, it won't do any damage, long-term damage, but it just, again, it will make the computer overall run slower and slower and slower. The hotter it gets, just like our brain, the hotter it gets, the slower it does, or it becomes, just like us. Our brain, as we get too hot, we uh, get slower and slower and slower. Here's an example of our heatsink and fan. However, this is a pretty small heatsink and fan. But again, it all depends on your needs. Most coolers are made out of aluminum, uh, just because the price of copper. However, since copper is a better conductive uh, conductor of heat, uh, they normally do some form of copper core, uh, because again, that's what's going to be touching the processor itself. So they do that copper, and then they do aluminum around it just to help draw the heat away from it. Now the power for the fan. It's typically a four pin a header, but it it really all depends. A fan makeup again, uh, they are really all depends. It's too subjective to say this is how it's going to be because our fan technology is constantly changing.
here is an example of our copper core and a thermal compound. So there has to be some type of lubricant between the processor and the device, uh, the, the heat sink, because again, both are metal, both are very careful. Our thermal paste kind of, or a thermal compound, kind of helps transfer that heat uh, easier from that processor to the uh, heat sink without any worry of damage. Uh, again, uh, around the processor, there should be one uh, dedicated, specific uh, power plug. You'll notice here, we have a three-pin uh, connector, but our power is actually a four-pin. They don't work well together. Now let's talk about case fans, or uh, other forms of fans. So one of the biggest issues that we have is proper cooling. Again, it ties kind of directly to the case, how the case is set up, how the case is uh, wired and whatnot. But normally we're looking at two types of fans. One fan at the front of the case to draw air in, and one, case, or one fan at the back of the case to push hot air out. That way we have a nice flow through the case. However, as we get more and more uh, add-ons that generate more and more heat, for example, our video, we have to do something that's helping draw away the heat from that as well. Here's an example of a third-party PCI uh, slot cooler. This helps cool uh, your add-on cards. Other forms of the fans um, could be a, a RAM cooler, so it's to help cool your memory. Uh, there's hard drive coolers. There's all different types of coolers, all depending on, again, your needs. One of the last major ones we talk about is liquid cooling. So liquid cooling works just like uh, your car, essentially. It pumps water or uh, a liquid from a reservoir, where that's all where the liquid's at, through your system, and it keeps pumping the, the liquid over hot components to a radiator. The radiator, just like a car radiator, uh, has a cooling fan that will cool the water as it goes through it, and it just cycles. Again, just like your car. The issue here is I, I started off by saying water. It's not necessarily water. Normally it is a non-conductive solution so that if a leak does occur, you don't have to worry about the liquid damaging your components. However, again, subjective. Also, is this better than air cooling? That's also, again, very subjective because it really all depends on the temperature of the room that you're in. If you're in a hot room, that liquid cooling can't cool that much because the room is already hot, which means the air in the room is hot, and you use that air to cool that radiator. So you could be cooling that radiator with hot air, thus not cooling it down. Okay, next we have to talk about dust. How do we clean, or how do we get rid of dust? That's always a big conversation, because that's something that we never think about. The big part there is an air compressor, or uh, a vacuum, or a canned air. It's really funny because it says at least uh, preventive maintenance to do the uh, cleaning twice a year. Again, subjective. It depends on where you're at. If you're in a carpeted area, maybe once a quarter, once every year. Uh, three months that might work. If you're in a 
tile or hardwood area, oh no, you want to do that once a month at least. Uh, my office has tile and it collects balls of dust, dirt, hair, everything. So you've got to be careful here because what dust does is it coats everything. Think of it more like a blanket. It wraps itself around all the components and so it acts as an insulator so that product gets warmer and warmer and warmer. Okay, last topic we have to discuss is selecting an appropriate power supply. So if we're building a new PC from scratch, first thing we start off with is not the power supply. Normally we deal with motherboard, memory, processor, video, but once we have a general idea of what we're going with, then our power supply. Because our power supply has to match all the other components as well as be able to provide enough power for all of those components. So if you select the power supply first, you'd have to be careful with what components you got because you'd be limited by your power supply. So that's something that So that's something you want to be able to, to keep in mind. I have noticed that most people like to pick their power supply out first, but again, uh, I've had a few uh, students build their PC, uh, get all their components, and then realize their power supply was too uh, weak or it didn't, couldn't supply enough power to power all of their devices, and then they had to return it and get a new one. So I mean, that's one of the things we have to think about. Uh, important factors is form factor, wattage rating, how much power it's going to uh, provide. Is there a fan? The important thing here is the type and number of power cables it provides. I've bought numerous power supplies that didn't have all of the correct power cables, so I had to get adapters and add-on cables, and it was just a nightmare. Lastly, quality and warranty. You get what you pay for. If you buy a $5 power supply, it's probably not going to be overall good quality. You have to be careful. Lastly, last thing we're going to talk about with this chapter is how to be provide the correct wattage. So first thing we have to think about is everything that we're going to connect to it uh, and then use a power supply calculator. If you go on the internet, Google power supply calculator, uh, almost every manufacturer of power supplies has a power supply calculator. They allow you to add up devices. And again, general rule of thumb is we want at least 20 to 30 percent over our needs just in case we want to grow or change parts or anything like that. And here's a general rule of thumb for our consumed watts, because our power supply is measured in watts. So for a moderate price motherboard, a processor memory, video, we think about 100 watts. If it's a super fancy motherboard with lots of features, 150 watts. And then we just add whatever components that we have. And then we get a general total. Add 20 to 30 percent, and that's our target. So hopefully, this has helped us all get a better understanding of proper maintenance, proper cleaning, cooling, and how to select a proper power supply. If you have any questions, please let me know. Have a great day.